Thank you very much for having me. Um, I feel at a disadvantage here coming at the end after, as Joe mentioned, those very small coffee cups. Um, so hopefully you're still going a little bit here. Um, anyway, it's great to be here. Um, as Nora mentioned, I work a lot on, on across the spectrum on uh, renewable energy, focusing mostly on the electricity sector, whereas I'll talk about there's a lot of stuff going on, um, but some very interesting and exciting overlap um, with a lot of the work that you do. So I always like to start with a question. Uh, to give some context, speaking of the electricity sector, um, which is how much do Americans spend on electricity each year? So how big is this sector? So I'm going to go ahead and just have you raise your hand as we go through this. Um, uh, we can even do it kind of auction style. Uh, do I have any takers at $3 billion for how much we spend collectively in the U.S. on electricity each year? All right, going once, twice. How about $30 billion? Nobody really? $300 billion? Okay. Quite a few folks get it. I was worried a little bit there that the coffee had run out. And $3 trillion. Who <laughs> thinks with $3 trillion? All right. You guys are pretty smart. So the answer is about $360 billion a year, which is about 2% of GDP. And the reason that I offer up that number to start out with is just to give you a sense of the context for how much is at stake in our electricity business um, as so much is transforming in the way that we get our electricity and that the market is changing. So let me talk a little bit about the electricity grid in particular. Uh, and uh, uh, as context for microgrids. Um, the first thing is that it's a marvel, but it's an inefficient one. This is, I'm going to give you a couple of statistics you've probably heard. Um, but it's, you know, the electricity grid in the United States has been called one of the top 10 engineering marvels of the 20th century. And yet, as you know, about two thirds of the energy that goes into that system never actually reaches its final destination. It's lost as a heat, uh, uh, as waste heat. Uh, not only that, that uh, due to many things, including uh, um, uh, more uh, extreme weather events, uh, such as Hurricane Matthew, um, the outage rate in our electric system has been rising fairly significantly over the past decade. And so we have a system in which we pour an enormous amount of our resources um, uh, that has been struggling to keep up um, with the changes that are happening. And this is in the context of what we really see as unprecedented options for the customers of the electricity sector, of the electricity system, uh, to produce their own energy. For example, in the time that I'm up here, we're probably going to see about 20 to 25 solar installations uh, put up in the United States, one about every 60 seconds, uh, happening at a remarkably fast pace. Um, we have a remarkable amount of personalized control. This is actually a picture of the wall thermostat in my home back in Minneapolis, where if I would like to right now during this talk, we could make it as warm in Minneapolis as it is here in Orlando, <laughs> um, probably to the dismay of my wife and children. Um, but we have the opportunity now to do much more than we've ever been able to do before at a personal level. And it's not just the fact that I can do that from here, which is remarkable in and of itself, but in, on this device on which I could do that, I have the capability to do many other things uh, to manage my own energy consumption, whether that's a, a smart thermostat, um, whether that's controlling lighting. Uh, my, uh, my mother, uh, 67 years old, is able to control um, some wires on her roof to melt the ice in the winter, an uh, indication that we're from Minneapolis and not from <laughs> Florida. Um, but there's all sorts of ways like this, uh, whether it's solar or, or uh, smartphones, that are giving uh, an unprecedented level of control at the local level in the electricity system. And we're starting to see uh, uh, the microgrids take a small slice of that. Uh, right now, about 0.1% of all of our electricity generation is coming from microgrids. Um, but they're growing uh, relatively quickly, as I'll talk more about later. I'll also give you a definition of microgrids, too. Now, what's also happening, though, in the electricity sector that's important to understand the context of this $360 billion opportunity is that we're up against what I like to call the monopoly problem, which is to say that in 30 states, like Florida and Minnesota, um, the electric company is a publicly sanctioned monopoly. It has a defined uh, geographic service territory, and no competition is allowed within that service territory. And that, of course, creates issues when all of these beautiful new technologies that are distributed um, uh, run up against that monopoly challenge. Uh, one of the ways in which we're seeing an issue is that there's an investment gap. As much as $57 billion needs to be invested in the distribution system, the poles and wires that run through the alleys that bring power to our commercial businesses, to our homes. Um, and that's where all of the uh, exciting in, uh, uh, opportunity and innovation is happening uh, in the electricity system, and yet we have a huge gap in investment at that level of the, uh, uh, of the electric system. Um, we also have uh, a, a culture um, of stagnation. Uh, within the electricity system. If you're a monopoly and you don't have competition, you don't have a lot of reason that you need to innovate. Um, and you see that in terms of the way that we meet the demands of the electricity system. And so I like to offer um, this anecdote. If you, if you were a baker and you were trying to prove the recipe for this cake that you were making, but you only made it once every five years, it was going to it's going to take you quite a long time uh, to make that recipe a lot better. And yet that 
is the time frame in which a lot of utilities, for example, are building new power generation or making upgrades to the grid system. And this in the context of, as I mentioned before, a system in which solar installs are happening once every 60 seconds. And so we have kind of a cultural clash here. One is that there's a lot of innovation and entrepreneurialism coming from the bottom up in the electricity sector, and yet from the top down, a culture um, uh, that is not uh, prone to innovation, uh, and that has not had to be, because the rules of the system uh, have in some ways even discouraged that behavior. Enter what we are calling the mighty microgrids, or this opportunity to um, do more of this development at a local level, whether that's uh, with solar or other things. So I'll stop for just about 20 seconds here and just let you read this definition rather than having me read it to you. So that definition comes from the U.S. Department of Energy. And what it basically means is, you know, a microgrid can act either with the grid or separate from the grid. It involves connected electrical loads or various sources of energy uh, demand and also various sources of energy production. Uh, a more personalized example might be to compare a microgrid to an adolescent, that it likes to act alone. It's capable of making some of its own decisions. It may benefit from remaining grid connected. <clears throat> and it has lots of possibility. I do not know this person, by the way. This was a Creative Commons license photo I found on the internet. So let me give you a few illustrations of the microgrids, uh, the interesting microgrids that, that, that I've been following, but also uh, transitioning to some of the ones I think that show the potential for overlapping with a lot of what you are interested in, in terms of biogas uh, and biofuel. So before I do that, though, I always like to, again, uh, give you an opportunity to, to weigh in, which is where, in which state, uh, is one of the first microgrids that's larger than a megawatt and 100% renewable. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to count to three, and you're just going to yell out the name of the state. And if I hear it, we all win. And if I don't hear it, well, we all win anyway, because I'm going to keep talking about this microgrid and give you this example. So one, two, three. I'm not sure if I heard it, but Vermont is the place that we were looking for. The good news is there are microgrids in many states, and so probably a lot of the states that you mentioned do have microgrids as well. But this, uh, this microgrid that we're talking about is uh, called Stafford Hill. Uh, it was developed by Green Mountain Power, and it's located in Rutland, Vermont. Um, it's about 2.5 megawatts of solar um, and a couple of different uh, battery storage uh, components. Um, it's actually built and owned by uh, the electric utility. Um, and its value is greater than its cost, which is to say not only the energy that it produces, but some of the grid support um, uh, that it can offer uh, is greater than the cost uh, uh, to produce the energy from that microgrid. Um, a few other examples, uh, Austin, Texas has a microgrid on their, uh, uh, at the University of Texas campus. Um, it's not renewable, but it is a combined heat and power facility that provides a lot of the electricity as well as the heating and cooling load for the campus. Uh, and in combination with energy efficiency, has managed to maintain a consistent level, actually, of uh, a, a percentage of the load served uh, over many, many years and, and offers millions of dollars in economic savings to the campus uh, for, uh, compared to buying that energy from the market. Uh, there's one in Long Island, New York. It's about a 50-50 split between renewables and fossil fuels. Uh, it's going to include 15 megawatts of local solar and 25 megawatt hours of energy storage. Uh, the fascinating thing about this one is that this is part of uh, New York is going through a process really changing the rules of the grid system to allow electric utilities to seek distributed <laughs> solutions to uh, infrastructure issues. Uh, the, the utility company there was uh, looking at a $300 million transmission and distribution grid upgrade in order to service the southern part of Long Island. Um, that was gonna, that's going to be offset by this microgrid project and by many other projects like this. Um, that providing distributed energy rather than uh, more transmission lines and large-scale power plant capacity. I also wanted to offer a few examples of microgrids, or what I like to call near microgrids, um, that, that touch a little bit more on uh, uh, into this uh, area of uh, biogas and organics resources. So Stone Edge Farm was actually the only thing that I could find in Google that was both a farm and a microgrid. Unfortunately, they don't use micro, uh, biogas uh, in this particular example, uh, but they do have a number of different technologies, uh, including solar PV, solar thermal, combined heat and power, batteries, and also some hydrogen. Um, you have a number of wastewater treatment plants, obviously, that are already looking, uh, already using biogas. Um, this one here in Gresham, Oregon, uh, it's not a microgrid, but it is net zero energy, which is to say on an annual basis, they produce as much energy on site as they uh, consume, uh, uh, driven by com two combined heat and power facilities, and as well as 420 kilowatts of solar. Um, another wastewater treatment uh, facility, Hill Canyon uh, in California, again, not a microgrid, but again, net zero energy on an annual basis. 
uh, 900 kilowatts of biogas combined heat and power, and 500 kilowatts of solar. So we're seeing a lot of this development uh, where municipal facilities, uh, high energy use, but also a lot of energy resource on site, um, are taking advantage of these new technologies to meet that energy uh, demand. And in some ways, uh, it's seen as both a gold standard and sort of the pure play uh, electricity microgrid standpoint, but the University of California, San Diego is a fascinating example of a microgrid. It's 42 megawatts, one of the largest ones in the country, uh, a com combination of many different technologies. Um, almost it provides almost 100% of the campus's total energy. Um, it also saves them about a million dollars. It was either a million dollars a month or a million a year. I apologize, I don't have that exact figure. Um, but one of the main reasons that they developed this microgrid was because, uh, as they put it, um, it's very expensive to have to recalibrate an electron microscope for your research lab when the power goes out. Uh, and so uh, helping support mission critical electricity needs uh, on, uh, at research campus. And it uses what they call uh, the world's largest fuel cell, a 2.8 uh, megawatt fuel cell um, that is uh, um, powered by directed biogas um, developed at a facility um, uh, uh, in the same region. So there are a lot of, I think, really powerful and interesting examples of microgrids that both cross over into the use of organics fuels and as well as some of the other exciting technologies in the electricity sector. But there are five what I like to call macro barriers to microgrids uh, that we see in terms of uh, the opportunity for their expansion. Um, the first one is that a microgrid is undefined in most state laws. And it's a little bit tricky if you're in a business that isn't defined in state law in a market that has traditionally had a lot of monopoly players to be sure about how you're going to be able to bring that uh, business to market. And that uncertainty is costly. Um, this, it, it flows into that second question about who is legally uh, allowed to sell and distribute electricity. Um, as I said, in 30 states, uh, electric service territories are defined by state law. And uh, the question about whether or not you are going to be regulated as a public utility if you try to operate a microgrid is one that has uh, been a challenging legal question for many microgrid de developers. Um, you have these utilities that uh, have control over the grid system, denying or, or making interconnection very expensive and complicated in order to bring online the various elements of the power generation as part of a microgrid. Uh, you have lack of a plug and play control solution. Um, you know, you can't just download you know, uh, uh, an op, uh, sort of microgrid operating system 10 from the internet and put it on a computer and it will run all of the different systems. Unfortunately, that tends to be a custom job. And the fact that it is one uh, and that we don't have kind of standardized software for operating microgrids uh, makes them much more expensive to deploy. And the final issue is, is who pay, pays for it and who benefits. And this comes into this issue of ownership. If, if the utility is a monopoly and the utility owns the microgrid, as with the Stafford Hill one in Vermont, um, it's a little bit more cut and dried. If there are economic benefits, they'll be shared among all the utilities, ratepayers, and shareholders, and the utility will pay for it. But when we have, in, in many cases, third-party microgrids, the question is, what, what do we do with the value that those microgrids offer to the grid system? One of the exciting things about microgrids is that uh, many of them have been, are being developed uh, actually in the wake of Hurricane Sandy and the impacts that it had on the grid in the northeastern port, uh, part of the United States. Uh, and the idea was that it would make the grid as a whole more resilient. And there, there's per a lot of examples of this. Um, even uh, s uh, solar and energy storage combinations that aren't microgrids can sell services into the larger grid to do things like maintain a consistent voltage. Uh, something that the utility has largely been responsible for, but for which there's a lot of value to be had. Um, the good news is that there are already some rule changes that we've seen in, in some states, I think, that are, that are moving ahead to make microgrids easier. Um, and I'm just going to run through these fairly quickly. Um, you know, the first one is whether or not you provide state funding. New York is a great example of a state that has um, what they call the New York Prize Program to provide money for feasibility studies. A state like Minnesota, for example, has no funding offered for microgrid development. Um, you have this question of regulation, whether or not a, uh, a microgrid might be regulated as a utility. Uh, in Minnesota, for example, um, if you serve less than 25 people, you do not qualify as a public utility. But if you serve more than 25 people or 25 customers, you may. Um, in New York, uh, the regulations are a little bit different. Um, but there's still some gray area there. Uh, again, getting to this question, are microgrids public utilities? In New York, they have uh, deregulated their utility system. and so. Uh, they are not considered utilities. In Minnesota, there's that 25 customer threshold that can create confusion. Um, our, our interconnection policy is set up well to make it easier to connect those microgrids to the grid system. And is there compensation that can be had by that microgrid operator from either the retail si uh, system or the wholesale system? So on the retail side, for example, if I'm producing energy for my own use, can I use net metering? Can I offset my own energy use on my electric bill? 
uh, in the wholesale market, is there a way for me to sell those energy services? Uh, they call them ancillary services. When you sell things like voltage support for the grid system, that has a lot of value to the utility, but in many places there's not a market for third parties to sell into that system. And of course there are other barriers too, and a perhaps the most important one uh, is uh, around this issue of ownership. In New York, for example, distribution utilities might be prohibited from owning microgrids, even though they may be good uh, potential operators of them. And in Minnesota, the fact that we have vertically, vertically integrated monopoly utilities, they'll likely look at microgrids as a serious threat to their market share and lobby against regulation that would make it easier uh, to implement microgrids. So when I was preparing this presentation, um, I have to confess that since most of my focus uh, is on distributed electricity production, uh, whether that's from um, looking at energy storage or solar or electric vehicles, I wasn't convinced at first that there was going to be a lot of overlap in this conversation about um, microgrids and, and biogas generation. So I saw this as a Venn diagram with very little overlap. Uh, and the good news is I found at least three different uh, kind of policy options or, or, or models uh, where there was more overlap than I expected. So one of them is this notion of the on-farm microgrid. And I gave you one example earlier. I didn't actually include uh, biogas, but I think there are going to be some more interesting opportunities for that where uh, we see, as, as the college campuses that I mentioned earlier, found it more economically uh, rewarding to have a microgrid. It was cheaper to provide energy for their campus with a microgrid uh, that we might start to see farms uh, and other agricultural operations find it to be economically feasible to do so as well. Um, the second one is that we you know, have that biogas resource that can be delivered uh, to that microgrid campus. So this, uh, this actually could be another illustration of a microgrid on a farm uh, or, or a, a, a campus, an industrial campus, an industrial park, a health facility, or some other one that's located in a rural area uh, near an organics resource or in an urban area for that matter. And the third one is this notion of uh, putting that biogas into the pipeline and, and having a credit system. So I'll, I'll have a couple examples here in, in a moment, but uh, for example, the University of California San Diego campus is not getting the biogas directly from uh, uh, the producer uh, that, that is in their region, but rather is um, having them it's, uh, put it into the pipeline and the campus is operating off the pipeline natural gas, but they're purchasing the credits uh, to be using that biogas. So there are a number of ways in which I think there are some very big opportunities, both for microgrids generally, but also for microgrids and biogas, and I'm just going to cover a few of them here. Um, one of them is sort of the, uh, the cost opportunity in, in two of the core technologies of the microgrid, both uh, solar PV and, and batteries, uh, which have come down uh, by a factor of 10 uh, since the year 2000, uh, or from the year 2000 till, to the year 2020. So a huge opportunity there in terms of the cost of the core microgrid technologies. And microgrids are actually growing faster than was originally anticipated. Even in the forecast from two years ago, uh, we're already ahead of that target, and they've raised their projection for microgrid development by as much as 50% uh, at Green Tech Media, which is one of the companies that follows this development most closely. Um, we also have seen, obviously, a lot of development in digesters. This map is of the ones that serve agricultural operations specifically, um, but uh, a huge potential for biogas recovery systems. This is from EPA's AgStar report in 2011, uh, 1.6 gigawatt capacity uh, uh, generating potential from biogas recovery systems uh, and not even including all of the, the heat resources that could be used um, from that development. And this is just at swine and dairy farms. Um, obviously, as others have mentioned, a lot of other potential from a lot of other sources. Um, and we're starting to see some really interesting overlap too, uh, uh, particularly with data centers um, run by some of the largest technology corporations. So in, in Maiden, North Carolina, you have Apple's new uh, data center uh, supported by a 10 megawatt fuel cell operation um, that's being uh, that's using landfill biogas again that directed biogas where the biogas is being put into the system and then uh, Apple is buying the credits for it. Um, you have Microsoft using wastewater biogas for their 250 kilowatt fuel cell uh, project um, at a uh, uh, data center in Wyoming, uh, and then you have eBay with its uh, uh, data center in South Jordan, uh, Utah, just outside of Salt Lake City. Um, was looking for a biogas option, um, hasn't actually go ahead, gone ahead to secure that yet, but has about a six megawatts of fuel cells running on natural gas that could be powered by biogas. So there are, I think, some really promising opportunities there. Um, data centers are expected to continue to expand very significantly as our use of the internet and, and those uh, online services expands. And there, there's a lot of interest both in low cost electricity, but also uh, resiliency and reliability of, of that electricity service. That, um, I think we're going to see a lot of opportunity there 
both for fuel cells and other uh, on-site generation opportunities, as well as an interest in a lot of those companies in being 100% renewable energy. I think one of the most important things to point out, too, is that biogas, unlike sort of the two other core renewable energy technologies, wind and solar, uh, is what we call both firm and flexible power. So on the left side of this chart, you see the monthly uh, production profile for uh, uh, ener uh, renewable electricity production in California. Uh, on the top in yellow, you have solar. In the light blue, you have wind. In the darker blue, you have hydro. And then at the bottom, at a fairly level production, you have biomass, biogas, and geothermal. And I think what's worth noting is that seasonally, of course, you have a lot of fluctuation in, in your wind and solar, uh, and r barely at all in terms of your uh, biogas and, and biofueled resources. And that's true even on a daily basis on the right-hand side there, where your solar obviously doesn't produce when it's dark, um, uh, but peaks very quickly uh, into the midday hours. And your wind, of course, fluctuates, uh, being less, uh, less windy during the day and more windy at night. Um, so uh, utilities are going to be looking for sources of electricity uh, that can be flexible, that can adjust up and down uh, to accommodate those variable resources that are becoming a larger and larger portion of the electricity on the grid system. I think the one big thing, though, that I'd like to leave you with uh, is the fact that uh, in my very brief uh, survey of the, the challenges that face uh, biogas development in terms of renewable energy is really getting parity in the, in the way that we incentivize renewable energy development. We have a lot of incentives that are targeted specifically on renewable electricity and not a lot of focus on renewable heat. And in my mind, that is the one big issue here, especially as we look at microgrid development or any type of uh, use of renewable uh, resources coming from organics is that heat is such a, a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity in terms of the two-thirds of the energy that we're losing in the electricity system right now, uh, but also in terms of how we develop this going forward uh, and making sure that we have uh, similar incentives for uh, electricity and heat, um, I think is going to make uh, the biggest difference in whether or not uh, biogas can play a bigger role in the electricity system writ large, but also in terms of microgrid development. And so with that, I thank you very much. We have uh, a full report that released in, Mar uh, released in March on microgrid development, a couple of very interesting podcasts on the rules uh, if you'd like to dive in deeper. Um, but I thank you so much for your time. Thank you.